Welcome to this video on how many indicators you should pick for your confirmatory factor analysis model or structural equation analysis. My name is Christian Geiser. On this channel I present weekly statistics tutorials usually related to multivariate statistical methods such as structural equation modeling or confirmatory factor analysis and often involving the M plus software. If this is something that interests you then please subscribe to this channel. Also don't forget to hit the like button and to check out the description for additional resources including a link to my weekly newsletter and to other uh, videos and workshops. So in this video here I want to discuss the number of indicators in confirmatory factor analysis and SEM. People often ask me how many indicators should I have for each factor? Is it enough if I have two indicators? Should I have three or should I have four or more? What happens if I have only two? Could this be a problem? Or could it be a problem if I have many indicators per factor? And so I want to discuss these issues in this video here and show you an example as well. So I want to start with a simple model, a two-factor CFA model that allows us to um, see the issues pretty clearly with the indicator question. So here you can see on the slide we have a two-factor CFA model with correlated factors. Each factor here has two indicators and the epsilon variables at the bottom indicate measurement error. So a model like this is identified, it could be estimated, but it's only identifiable under certain conditions. And so in this model, when you have only two indicators per factor and you estimate the factor loading freely for one of the indicators per factor, so meaning when you have a congeneric model with different loadings between the indicators where you estimate the loadings, then this model is identified only if those two factors are substantially correlated. So meaning this covariance here between the two factors, this has to be non-zero and it can't be close to zero in your empirical application because then you could run into identification issues, empirical under identification. And so this is maybe the primary reason why you often hear this recommendation in the literature that says you should have at least three factor, three indicators, excuse me, per factor, because when you have at least three indicators for each factor, then a factor model by itself, so a single factor model, would already be identifiable regardless of whether the factor is correlated with another factor or with an external variable or something like that. So this is the reason why three indicators or having three indicators is a good thing because if both of these two factors F1 and F2 each had three indicators that were adequate measures that had adequately sized loadings on these factors, then the model would be identified regardless of whether these factors are correlated or not. Now, this means in other words, though, that you are fine as long as you have factors that are correlated. So if your factors are related or if you have external variables that are substantially related with the factors, then you could go with just two indicators per factor because then the identification is set, so to say. But nonetheless, there can be problems when you have just two indicators per factor. There could be other problems. Like for example, we know from simulation work that models that have only two indicators per factor are more prone to improper solutions in general. So we know that improper solutions with negative residual variance estimates are common for misspecified models, they're relatively common for small samples, but they're also common when you have designs with just two indicators per factor. And so this is another um, argument, so to say another reason why people recommend having at least three indicators per factor because it stabilizes your um, your identification and also the estimation of the model, so you are less likely to run into an improper solution. Now, 
what can you do, so to say, when you have only two indicators available? So if you have only two items or you have only two scales, well, then I would say go ahead and try and see what you get. So you will see it. If you run into an identification problem, you would see it. Then you might find that the model doesn't converge or you get some other error message. And then if that happens, so if it's due to a low correlation of this factor or zero correlation of this factor in question with other variables, then what you could do is you could add other variables to the model that are correlated with this factor because then that helps identification. If you add an, an external variable, it could be a manifest variable or it could be another factor, then that might help you identify your two indicator factor. So it's not, not all is lost, so to say, if you run into this problem. Another um, thing that you can do is you can add more constraints. So if it's reasonable, to assume that the two indicators of that factor are essentially tau equivalent or tau equivalent in the sense of classical test theory, meaning if you can assume that they have equal loadings because they're measured on the same scale, maybe those are two test halves of the same test that have the same metric, the same units of measurement, and you could fix the loadings to be equal or set the loadings equal on that factor for the two indicators and then that also helps with identification if you have equal loadings but of course this has to be reasonable because that assumption implies that the variables are essentially tau equivalent and so then you have to think about whether that is reasonable. Now another thing is that sometimes we have only one indicator. So sometimes you have only one test or one questionnaire scale for a factor and then a lot of people ask what should I do then if I have only one indicator. Now if your one scale or test consists of multiple items then one thing that you can do is you can split the test so to say or the scale into test halves where you maybe for example randomly assign the items to two parcels as we say or test halves or three parcels if you feel like that is safer to have three indicators per factor and that way like let's say your scale consists of nine items then each parcel could have three items that are assigned either to random assignment or some other assignment rule and then you use those item parcels as indicators of your factor when you want to use a structural equation model. And there's some controversy about item parceling and I'll make a video on that topic um, as well in some time in the future, but that is a possibility. So when you can have, uh, when you have a multi-item test or scale, you can distribute the items across multiple uh, subscales or item parcels to obtain multiple indicators. Another option that is favored by other people is to use the items directly as indicators of a factor. And that has the advantage that you can then study the dimen dimensionality of your scale directly. So you can use ordinal factor analysis, for example, using weighted least squares estimation in M plus WLSMV, or it's called DWLS, um, in the Lavan software, so an ordinal, an estimation method for ordinal items, and you can directly then have your items as indicators of a factor using ordinal factor analysis. That's also a possibility. One difficulty with that could be if your scale consists of many items, let's say you have 20 items, then it's probably not reasonable to assume that all 20 items measure exactly the same factor. So meaning the unidimensionality assumption could be violated or you could run into a model that is very large because you have so many indicators and they all have to have their factor loadings estimated and so on. So it's sometimes a little tricky to make a compromise here between having item level data or having item parcels and this is something that um, has been discussed in the literature. So there's a lot of literature on the pros and cons of item parceling and so if this is something that you would consider doing then I recommend that you check out the literature on item parceling which is readily available. There are some papers in, published in the journal Psychological Methods and, um, and other outlets as well.
Now there's another uh, thing to consider here and that is some people say it's actually enough to have a single indicator. So you could also just specify a factor model with a single indicator and uh, that requires, so to say, that you have a knowledge about the reliability of the single indicator measure. So you have a reliability estimate and then based on the reliability coefficient you can fix the error variance, so the variance of epsilon here for that single indicator so that the factor variance, the true score variance can be identified. And this is an approach that also works, at least in theory, where the loading would be fixed to one and the error variance is fixed according to the reliability estimate that allows you to come up with the error variance estimate and that's also something that you can do. It requires you to have uh, adequate knowledge about a reliability estimate though that applies to your specific sample and that applies to this measure and you have to be cautious because if you have a wrong reliability estimate that doesn't apply to your sample then it could compromise your model and your estimates of the structural model if you incorrectly set the error variance to a value that is not correct, then that can bias your path coefficients in an SEM or the correlations in a confirmatory factor analysis. Now one last thing to consider is uh, some people say, well, you should have as many indicators as possible because that helps with identification and provides a lot of information. And in principle, that's correct. So to say, as long as you have good indicators, it is better to have more than fewer, all other things being equal. So it, is, it, is te it tends to be better to have more indicators, as long as these are good indicators. Now, what does good mean? Good means they have to be unidimensional, unidimensional and if, if possible, they should have high standardized loadings, meaning high reliability. So they should be strongly correlated with the factors that they measure. And then if you have many of those, then of course it is a good thing because it helps identify and stabilize the estimates that are related to the latent factors, including the factor variances and covariances. And so having more indicators is better, all other things being equal. However, in practice, it is difficult to find many indicators that are unidimensional for a given factor. So especially with questionnaire data, when the items measure slightly different aspects of, let's say, emotions or subjective well-being or personality, then oftentimes you introduce complexity and, and it can lead to model misfit to have nine indicators or 10 indicators or more per factor, even having five indicators that are unidimensional could be pretty difficult to find. That's, that's something that in practice is not very realistic. So I think a good compromise is to say, um, having the goal when you plan your study of having three or four indicators per factor, that is good. If you can find four good indicators of your factor, that's already plenty and that should help you with identification. Then if one has to be deleted because it ends up not being good, a good indicator, then you still have three. And with three, you have stable identification. You shouldn't have any problems if those are good indicators of your factor. So you should strive to identify in the planning phase of your study four or maybe five indicators, make sure that they are valid and reliable, and then you should be good to go once you collect your data then you still have room for dropping an indicator if it tends to of it, if it shows to be um, not a good indicator in your empirical data so that's something that i would recommend to be on the safe side i hope you found this video useful to get started with your sem analysis and think about how many indicators you should have per factor. If you like the video, then please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel, to leave a comment in the comment section and to check out the description for additional resources. And I'll see you next week.